Did you know that one out of every people in the United States has an aneurysm in their brain and they don't even know? That's 6.8 million people. There is a person that has a brain aneurysm rupture every 18 minutes. It's over 30,000 ruptures per year. September is Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month, so let's talk about it. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 54-year-old woman who had a really bad headache and went to bed to sleep it off, and the next morning, her family could not wake her up. This was the CT scan of her brain performed upon arrival to the emergency department that showed a large amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. All of this white stuff in the brain here is blood, including a small intracerebral hemorrhage near her right middle cerebral artery. This is a pretty classic scan of someone with a ruptured MCA aneurysm. Aneurysms are little bulges in the side of the wall of a blood vessel. What happens is the side wall of the vessel can become weak and you start to get bulging of that blood vessel. And you can imagine if this thing continues to get weaker or larger, it can rupture. You see, our brain has a distinct anatomy of different blood vessels that supply different parts of the brain. We have four main arteries that enter our head from our neck, two vertebral arteries which are in the back, and two arteries called the carotid arteries in the front. Those come together right here to form the circle of Willis. What you talking about, Willis? I'm talking about how your brain gets oxygen. On any patient that comes in with stroke-like symptoms, we perform a CT scan of the patient's brain as well as a CTA to check the blood vessels. A CTA is where we inject dye into an IV that goes into the patient's blood vessels and we can evaluate the blood vessels in the brain to see if there's any vascular abnormalities, such as an aneurysm. And a CTA can also show the lack of flow through a blood vessel, such as in a stroke. Therefore, it's a pretty common test that we perform in the ER. We can decide then if formal diagnostic cerebral angiography is needed, which is where we take the patient to the endovascular lab where we can cannulate someone's blood vessel and actually inject dye to get much better pictures, like right here. And right here in our patient, we see the middle cerebral artery aneurysm that ruptured. About 30% of all aneurysm ruptures are the MCA. It's because the MCA bifurcates and that leaves a spot right here that can become weak. Think of a water hose with all this pressure hitting right here and then needing to split off. The weak point that develops will be right here. And that's what can happen. There are two different types of aneurysm. One is called a saccular aneurysm, which is where you have a focal point of weakness that causes the aneurysm, or a fusiform aneurysm where the entire blood vessel wall is weak and it kind of bulges out. The majority of aneurysms are saccular aneurysms, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Risk factors are advanced age, hypertension or high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, alcohol use, atherosclerosis of the blood vessels, which can cause them to be weak, as well as cocaine use, which can cause a surge in your blood pressure and can lead to aneurysms. There is also some inherited risk factors, connective tissue diseases, including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan syndrome, polycystic kidney disease, amongst many other conditions. Compared to the general population, someone with a first degree relative, like a parent that has a cerebral aneurysm, is three to seven times more likely to have an aneurysm. If you have a family member that has a diagnosis of an aneurysm, it's important to talk to your doctor to see whether or not you should be screened. I could make a video that's several hours long about how we diagnose and treat aneurysms, as well as how they form, so I'm gonna try to keep it really simple. The ventricles are the fluid-filled spaces of the brain, and in a patient with an aneurysm rupture, these ventricles can be filled with blood and cause hydrocephalus or an increase in pressure in the brain. We treat this by placing an external ventricular drain, which is a drain that can be placed at the bedside, where a neurosurgeon will drill a small hole and place this catheter directly into that ventricle, which will then drain the blood out into a bag beside the patient. That monitor also allows us to measure the patient's ICP and treat it accordingly to make sure that the swelling in the brain can be controlled as best we can. We then need to treat the aneurysm that ruptured. Please note that that aneurysm is not continuously bleeding. What happens typically is there is a burst of the blood vessel, it bleeds a little bit, and then it will clot off so 
there is not continuous bleeding. And if there is, it's likely those patients that die on the scene and do not even make it to the hospital, which is about one third of patients. So in other words, these patients that we're treating are not actively bleeding, but they do run the risk of re-rupturing that aneurysm, which is up to 23% in the first 72 hours. Of course, the consequences of a re-bleed can be catastrophic with up to a 60% mortality rate. So we need to clip or coil the aneurysm. Those are two vastly different procedures. Coiling of an aneurysm is something done endovascularly where there's no actual cut on the head and we can go through a catheter and feed small little wires into the dome of the aneurysm and cause it to clot off. Basically obstruct the flow of any type of blood within the aneurysm dome. Clipping, which is a more traditional approach, is where we can open up the patient's head with surgery and place a clip over the aneurysm's neck and cause it to be completely occluded. How we decide who gets clipped versus coiled really depends on a lot of different factors, including the location of the aneurysm. Here you can see in our patient that an endovascular neurosurgeon went in there and coiled off that aneurysm. Here's what those coils look like on the x-ray. After the aneurysm is secure or obliterated, we then focus on the medical management of any complications that can happen after. And these patients are usually pretty sick for a few weeks after an aneurysm rupture. They are at risk of hydrocephalus, which is what that drainage tube was treating. And some patients even go on to need permanent shunting or diversion of the spinal fluid to the belly to decrease the intracranial pressure that can even persist in the long term. These patients are also at risk of seizures, hyponatremia or low sodium, deep venous thrombosis or blood clots, cardiopulmonary complications such as arrhythmias or even cardiomyopathy. So they got a lot going on. But one of the most concerning things that we wanna to try to prevent is delayed ischemia. That's called cerebral vasospasm, which is where a normal blood vessel can actually start to squeeze down and decrease blood flow to the brain and that can cause a stroke. Believe it or not, that happens in 30 to 40% of patients that suffer a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is a complex pathway of some of the factors that we think contribute to vasospasm. And these are important mechanisms to understand because it actually explains how we treat these patients to help prevent vasospasm. Here's a good diagram that helps explain this. Treatment and management of patients with ruptured aneurysms can be extremely complicated. And the long-term complications in patients can vary depending on the severity of the brain damage from the rupture. Only one third of patients that suffer a ruptured aneurysm actually recover to back to normal. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a major life event and can lead to long-term medical complications, including depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, speech difficulties, memory function difficulties, and persistent cognitive dysfunction, along a vast other amount of neurological issues that may persist. Of course, these patients are treated with intense rehab, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and psychotherapy. In our patient, she went on to needing a ventricular peritoneal shunt for persistent increased pressure in her brain after the aneurysm was treated. She's about a year out from her aneurysm rupture at this point and has persistent cognitive difficulties as well. She has to have ongoing help with day-to-day -day functions, including paying her bills, managing things in her household. But she has a supportive family and is ongoing continued therapies and is improving. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care Stay tuned next week and we'll go through another case.